What we're going to do today is we're going to start talking about how to program services. And so this will dovetail into assignment number four. The example we're going to use here is not unlike your assignment, although it's, of course, different enough so that you can't just cut and paste the solution and have it work. You'll have to do some thinking about how the pieces fit in. But basically, it's a, a download application, and uh, you basically give it images, and it downloads them and displays them, and it uses a service to do this. And so we're going to talk about how to use activities and started services to do this, and then later we'll come back and talk about other techniques like intent service and various bound services and so on. So here's a quick overview of the download application. So there's a download activity, and of course, that's where the, uh, the user is going to interact with, with the, the user-facing portion of the code in order to be able to describe what image they want to download. That's pretty straightforward. There's a download service. That's the part that's going to actually kind of do the heavy lifting of doing the downloading. There's also something called a service handler, which is something that runs in the context of the service, and that's the part that handles the concurrency. So it's going to go ahead and concurrently uh, download and, and store the images and so on. And then it's going to go ahead and return the results back to the activity where the activity's download handler will display them. So the handler is a class that's nested in there. So that kind of gives you a, a bird's eye view of the class structure of the various parts here. And of course, we're going to be using all kinds of Android features to do this, like Android concurrency frameworks and so on. This is a non-trivial example, so we're going to look at it from a couple of different perspectives. Does anybody see the three perspectives in this picture? First of all, does anybody know who, who painted this picture? Escher, M.C. Escher. He's a good friend of M.C. Hammer, but uh, a little different. So this is called the three worlds, and you can see the mud and the reflection in the water, and then you see a moon in the background. So we're going to look at things from a couple different views. The code is all available here. I recommend you take a look at this. This will help you with your assignment, although it's definitely not a cut and paste thing. So use the source. All right, so the way this is going to work is the download activity is going to create an intent, and it's going to go ahead and, and uh, start up a service by passing the intent to the service via start service. So this is something that's based on uh, the so-called activator pattern, which is a pattern from the actually from a paper I wrote many years ago. If you Google activator pattern, you'll get a chance to learn how activators work. And they basically start things up on demand. So in this particular case, you're starting the service up on demand. If it's not already running, it'll be launched so it can run. There are basically four main things that happens in situ situations like this when you write these kinds of services. Now, what I'm going to talk about here is what you would do if you were to write all this stuff by hand. You'll see later that there's a really cool framework that's part of Android called the Intent Service that automates a lot of these steps. And that's what you'll actually be using uh, if you're doing the undergrad version of the assignment for. But it's important also to know what's kind of going on under the hood. So the first thing that happens, either if you do it yourself or if you use the Intent Service, which does this for you, there's a thing called a Service Handler. And that's a class that you go ahead and instantiate. And this particular class is associated with a single thread of control. So it'll have one thread that kind of runs in the background processing the work requests that are given to it from the main thread of the service. Now, see if anybody remembers what we talked about before. Do you remember when we talked about services before? And we talked about how services don't run in a separate process or in a separate thread unless you instruct them to. By default, if you load a service, if you start a service, it'll run in the main thread in the same process as the activity that spawned it. So if you don't want that, you have to programmatically set things up to run in a different process and or in a different thread. So in this particular case, we're going to have a different thread and it's going to run in the background. And this thread is going to be implemented using something called a handler thread. And we'll talk more about that uh, in just a minute. That's a feature that comes with Android that runs its own looper, which is kind of cool. The main thread, which is in this case running in a separate process, is going to actually receive the intent that's sent over from the activity when it calls start service. And it's going to go ahead and the on start command is going to be invoked. And the on start command is then going to go ahead and queue the intent with the handler, with the service handler. And that will then go ahead and stick it on a queue. And then later, the other thread that's running in the background is going to go ahead and pull the intent off of the queue, 
And then it'll go ahead and download the image that was designated in the intent and reply back to the, the caller. And uh, of course, this all works because the URL for the image to download is actually attached as part of the intent, as the data for the intent or the, the extra. We're not doing it as extras, but you could do it as an extra. All right, so if you go back and, and watch the discussion about activity and service communication that we talked about last time, you'll see that we, we alluded to some of this stuff in there. This particular implementation will shut itself down when there are no more intents to handle. So after everything's been processed and pulled off and run, then if there's no other work to do, this particular implementation will shut itself down. And you see that that kind of mimics the way things work with the Android intent service that you'll be using. Now keep in mind the intent service is way easier than doing all the steps that I'm showing you here, but it's important to know how these things work. If for another reason, that's how the intent service works and you may have to uh, maintain or work on code that doesn't have an intent service where knowing how these steps work are important. So this is basically an idiom for concurrent processing where we're going to offload tasks into a separate thread so that we don't block the main thread. And remember, that's the whole key to a lot of Android concurrency is to avoid blocking the main thread because if the main thread blocks for more than a uh, certain amount of time, the system decides, aha, something's gone awry and it shuts down the program or it gives you a dialog box that lets you decide to shut the program down. And there are actually lots of things in the world that work that way. Um, telecom switches typically work the same way. They have audits where they run in the background and keep track of how, how long tasks are running in the switch and if they run for too long, they get killed. Now, this particular idiom, as well as the Android intent service, doesn't work if the service needs to handle multiple requests concurrently. This particular solution only handles one request at a time, but it's off the main thread. So it's a particular kind of worker, th uh, worker thread model, worker thread model, not worker threads model. And we'll see later, especially if you do the grad student version of the assignment, that it does some additional things. So it goes beyond what we do here with the simple model. And that's why the grad students get to do it. This design is guided by something called the command processor pattern, which you can read about here. And we'll talk about this when we get to patterns later. But this is a very common pattern that's used a lot in Android and Java to create runnables that get run in a different context in another thread. All right, so that's kind of the overall view. John, John. You said that that's, you can't use that for doing multiple act, like services, for launching multiple services? Uh, so the way that we show here, there's only one background thread and there's a queue of work for it to do. And every time the activity sends it work, the service sticks it in a queue, and then that thread running the queue pulls it off and processes it. So are you not allowed to use multiple backgrounds? There's only a single background thread that you can use? With, with, with this particular idiom, okay. and also with the intent service. As you'll see. So the intent service has one background thread that it's. The intent service has one background thread. You'll see later when we talk about it, which will probably be Monday at this rate, that if you're, or, or uh, for those of you who, who want to learn sooner than Monday, because you may be doing the grad version of the assignment, if you take a look at the index.html file, there are links to videos that explain all this stuff, which you can see at your own rate if you want to learn about this earlier. Um, there are other ways of being able to do concurrency, which allow you to have a pool of threads or spawn a thread per request or various things like that. Tristan? And that thread designation is, is off somewhere in the, in the XML file? So, good question. So, the process, the process directive is in the XML file, the Android manifest XML file, the thread designation has to be done programmatically, although it can be done in a fairly simple way, but you have to write code, you have to use code that already has been written. So it doesn't come, f it, doesn't, it doesn't appear out of thin air, although it isn't too hard yeah, to do. I was, I was wondering how you went about you know, specifying that that would be. Right, so the threading is done programmatically, the process dimension is done declaratively. Okay. That's the fancy term for that. All right, so let's go a little deeper into how all this stuff works, and it'll give me a chance to show off my super cool animated slides. So this is how you start a service. And you've seen bits and pieces of this, but we'll take a little bit closer look at this. So here's a little snippet of code from the download activity. We're going to do some stuff, and we're going to cause, cause the service to start passing it the intent. And if you read this link, it'll tell you more about this. The way this, of course, is going to work, and this is very much like your code, and the reason it's like your code is it's using a, a pattern, which we'll talk about later in the course, called the factory method pattern. And what we're doing here is we're making a factory method, which in this case is called make intent. Factories usually have the word make or create in them. And we're going to make an intent, and the implementation of make intent hides all the details of how the intent is made. 
and then it passes back an intent, which is passed to start service. Yes, sir. So what's the difference between um, factory method and the constructor? Oh, great question. What is the difference between factory method and constructor? Does anybody want to hazard a guess as what a difference might be between factory method and constructor? That's a really good question. A constructor runs when an object is created, and a factory method doesn't have to run that. It can be run whenever. Right, right. So, so one observation uh, Jonathan has is that constructors are run when an object is created, um, and a factory method can do some additional things beyond what the constructor does. But, but in a sense, they're still playing a very similar role. So there's a, a slightly deeper and more distinct difference. Yeah. So the, the factory method is going to be making an, uh, an, an instance of a class that it's not a part of. So like for there, it's, it's making an intent, but it's, par it's, it's packaged within the, the download service Great, uh, great. Class. So Tristan's observation is good. So, so in this particular case, we don't really know how this thing is being made, right? Ma abstraction for creating Th there's additional abstraction. But the real reason, which, which we actually don't really use here, but is the case with the pattern, um, there's no such thing as a virtual constructor. Right? When you make an, an object by saying new foo, or whatever the object is, you're making a foo. Right? End of story. Right? You hard code the foo-ness into the call to the constructor itself. Right? So there's no way to easily come along and, and change what's <laughs> created. You have to go in and change the name of the constructor. You'd have to say new bar if you wanted a subclass of foo, or new foo bar, or something like that. Whereas with a factor method, which is sometimes called a virtual constructor, that's another name people sometimes use for it, that could actually be a virtual method. So you could actually change its behavior without changing any of the code. And that's the real secret sauce to the, the patterns. We'll see that later. There are some languages that would give you more leeway and more flexibility there, but in C++ and Java, you use patterns to get that flexibility. So here you can see we go ahead and you know, take the URL, and we, we parse it. It's a string. We turn it into a URI that gets passed into there. And when this thing is done, however it's done, you know, and that's up to you to decide how that's going to work, um, we call start service. By the way, the other cool thing about using a factory method here, we can make late binding decisions in our design. In other words, we can, make, we can change our mind about how tightly coupled the service is with the activity. So it might turn out that if we were to go rummage around and see make intent, maybe it hard codes the intent to a particular class. Right? We might say, you know, when you create the intent, we might say, go use the download service dot class association. Right? You might hard code that. Or we could have it return an intent that's not hard coded, that uses implicit binding. And the good news is we don't know, we don't care at this point in the code how tight that coupling is. That decision can be deferred. We can make changes without breaking anything in our design. Yeah? But isn't it coupled in the sense that you're invoking the download service that class you created? Like in this particular case, but that's, I could go ahead and, and replace download service dot make intent with um, you know, my intent factory, or you know, I, I could just have a method I call there. So you could make it as, as decoupled as you want. Likewise, download service itself might be some kind of facade that underneath would create something else that it would return. So you can make things much less tightly coupled. This call, this start service call, doesn't block while the download service runs. And so as a result, it can go and do its own thing while this is taking place. All right, so that's how you launch a service. Pretty straightforward, obviously. Let's talk now about how you process a service that's been started, how the processing takes place. So under the hood, the Android uh, service framework, which is implemented by the Android Activity Manager service, which is an internal um, system service, goes ahead and starts the service if it's not already running. And this is, uses the activator pattern, which as you can see, efficiently and transparently automates scalable on-demand activation and deactivation of services accessed by clients, which is the mouthful way of saying it creates things on demand. So you don't have to have them up and running until they're used, which means that resources will be used more economically. You would read more about the pattern here. Started services, just like activities we talked about before, are driven by inversion of control. I'm sure I gave the example of the Hollywood principle, don't call us, we'll call you. Another good example of inversion of control is a, is a uh, you know, roller coaster that goes upside down. It's inverting things. Um, you can read more about inversion of control here. And so in particular, when you start a service, the onCreate method is called first, 
followed by on start command. And we'll talk a bit about each of these things in here. So the download service extends service and its on create method will go ahead and start a handler thread. I won't show you that code right here, but we'll look at code later that illustrates how that works. Now, how many times is on create called on a service? Once, the first time it's activated. And once it's activated, it's up and running. Now, of course, if the system were to deactivate the service, because services can be deactivated if you're running, if Android decides you're out of memory, they'll shut them down, then it may have to be called again. But typically, you can think of on create is something like a constructor. It's like a virtual constructor that initializes the life cycle of a service. And this handler thread, which we'll talk about later, works in conjunction with this thing called a service handler to do the downloading in, of the image in the background and returning the path name to the client. All right, so that's basically how we're going to get things up and running. Now, the on start command is also called, but unlike on create, which is only called the first, only called once, the first time the service is created, the on start command hook method is called back every time somebody calls start service after the service has been launched the first time. So it's, it's launched, it's also called back the first time, but it's also called back over and over again every time someone passes a new intent by a start service to the service. That's a, it's a little bit hard to get your head around that, but the first time start service is called and the service is started or activated, on create is called, and then on start command is called. But every subsequent time someone calls start service, as long as the service keeps running and hasn't shut itself down or been shut down, on create is not called subsequently, but on start command is. So on start command is how you get stuff in there. Kevin, yes. Uh, are services singleton objects? Um, that's a good question. So it, it sort of depends how you configure your system to work. But um, whoever, you know, whoever implements the service, well, let's see. If it's not running in a separate process, in other words, if it's non-shared service, then they will not be singletons because every application that runs them will have its own service inside of it. If you make a shared process, if it runs in a process, then you can actually have many applications share that service. So in that case, it would be a singleton in that case. So it really depends on whether you make it running in a process or not. If you want to share it, it needs to go in a process. Um, otherwise, it'll be running in the context of the application in which it started it. Because, yes? Great, 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 great question. So the question basically is, what should the life cycle or the lifetime of the service be? <coughs> should it persist? Should it stick around for a while? Should it be a so-called standing service? That's the fancy name for it. Or should it be a one-shot service? And it really depends on a variety of things. It depends on um, how much you expect to be downloading stuff, right? So if you're going to download something and then display the image and go away, keeping it running around is probably not a good idea because it's wasting resources and not being used. Conversely, if you're going to start up a download session, you're going to download a whole bunch of things, you probably want it to keep running. So there's a couple different answers to your question. If you're using started services, you have to decide the life cycle. If you're using the intent service, then the way it works is as long as there's work, there's intents in its queue, it will keep running. The minute it goes and it finds there's nothing in its queue, it shuts itself down. If you use bound services, which we'll talk about later, as long as a client has a binding to a service, that service will remain running. And only when the last client, typically activity, but component, unbinds from the service, will the service shut itself down. So let's say we were using an intent service, right? Uh -huh. I don't really understand what, how the queue works. Like, uh, if I were to select one specific, if I wanted to download something, I press the download button. Yep. Great. So you're, the application that you're going to write really only lets you do one thing at a time. But it's not hard. I mean, I won't make it an exercise for the student, but it could be an exercise for the student to have it pass over a bunch of images to download. And we have variants of the thing that you can look at in the, 
in the GitHub repository from other classes that give it a whole you know, chunk of things to do. So you could either give it a list of images to download, or you could call start service multiple times, or you could have a GUI where you know, people could keep pressing start service you know, sort of, um, you know, obsessively, just clicking, cl downloading these files like, like Glenn Close in Fatal Attraction, just sitting there clicking you know, the service, downloading repeatedly. And so in that particular case, you'd end up with lots of requests that would queue up. So the answer to your question is it, there's no one answer, right? It depends on the use case. Um, as a general rule of thumb, on Android especially, because you're, you don't have all the memory in the world, it's not like you're running on a, a terabyte server or something with gigs and gigs of memory, um, you probably need to shut things down sooner rather than later. And that's the way this is going to work. But the answer to your question in general is it depends. So on start command gets passed, the intent plus some other stuff, which we're not going to talk about right now. And uh, it does a bunch of things. It returns. So here's an interesting thing. On start command returns a result to the Android service framework, but this result doesn't go back, back to the client directly. And here are some of the things that you can return here. So one thing you can do is you can return start sticky. And um, what this basically says is, let's see, this will restart the service. If the service gets shut down for some reason, either because it crashes or because Android decides it's out of memory or whatever, it will restart the service automatically, but it won't re-deliver the intent. It'll just pass it a null intent so it can figure out this was being restarted, not the first time it was started. So that's the start sticky return. There's also the start not sticky return value, and that says this, if the service crashes or gets shut down, it should remain shut down until it's restarted by another activity. And then there's also start redeliver intent. So this restarts the service via on start command, and it gives it the same intent that was delivered originally. So can anybody think about why you would choose one of these return values versus another? What would be the motivation for wanting to make something sticky? Yes, sir? So, so one example would be... Well, it's a plausible use case. It's, it's more likely you have a service that's playing in the background like, um, I don't know, it's a music playing service and you want it to be playing your brain candy song or whatever you want to be playing. <clears throat> or you want it to be playing in a gata de vida, right, which is like 20 minutes long and it goes on and on and on. So if for some reason the system comes along and, and kills that service because it's out of memory, when it starts it back up again, you might want to have it keep playing the song again, right? Or watching a movie might be another good example where you want it to restart. Uh, other things where, you know, maybe you want to find out the current time of day or something, which, which would be a strange thing to do with a service, but you want to be able to do something where there's no sense in, in you know, restarting it. You want to wait till someone asks the question again because you're going to get a newer answer anyway. So those are examples of things you would not want to be sticky. But those are basically return values you can give back from on start command. Yeah? So you said sticky is when it would restart from the same place? So, well, sticky, so there's, there, there's non-sticky, which says don't start, yeah. don't restart. And then there's two variants of sticky. And I didn't come up with these names, so you've got to blame them. But start sticky says restart the service, but don't give the same intent. Pass a null so it knows it's been restarted. So if it needs to know what the intent was, it better cache it away somewhere persistently. Start redeliver intent really should say start sticky redeliver intent because it says restart the service but give it the same intent. So that, that's even more, you know, it's, it's sort of like pretend like this never happened and it's just restarting over again from the beginning. Jonathan. So the redeliver intent would be like if it crashed and you started the song over from the beginning. Zero. Yeah. And, but start sticky, if you had saved where you were when it crashed, you could start from if you, if you periodically checkpointed how far along you were in the playout buffer, then when you restarted, you could go ahead and you know, zip up there and go, oh, I'm restarting. You know, I might better figure out where I was. So playing back songs may not be the best example, but you get the point, right? You're doing something where you're picking up where you left off. Can, can you set it up so that the, um, so your, flat, your service detects whether or not it's, it's, it, that instance of the service is, is a result of a, of a restarting? Yes. Well, so, so start, sticky, start Sticky is actually telling you this is restarting. Mm 
right? It, it's, it's not telling you it's the nth, nth time it restarted. Maybe the, the tenth time it's restarted, but it's not, actually, Android doesn't restart services if they crash more than a couple times. But um, this, this is telling you this is a restart as opposed to a first start. Now, if you need something else, you, you can also use uh, persistent information like um, uh, there's a shared preference. There's a really cool thing called shared preferences in Android, which is the poor person's persistence. And we'll actually look at an example here later about how to use this probably on next Monday. And, and you can actually store things persistently. So if things crash and you come back up, you, they have the state that they were in before. And it's used for storing preferences. Well, it'll, it, the service is restarted. Whether the state is reloaded is up to your program to periodically checkpoint its state. But, but yes, it'll restart the service, and then the service would have to say, oh, gosh, I've been restarted. I'd better restore the state that I had before. And then if it wants to do that, it should be checkpointing its state periodically if, if that's important to its function. You would have to write... You would have to write the code, but mechanisms exist in Android to allow that. Yes, yes. It, this, is, this is only if the service crashes, correct? Yeah, the service so crashes. If activity that's called it crashes, and it's trying to return something back, and it just nothing happens. Uh, weird things happen, yes. <clears throat> they, they, it, so really good question. If the activity dies, but the service is still running, and the service is trying to get the stuff back to the activity, then depending on the mechanism used to deliver it, um, it might or might not be queued. It may just evaporate into thin air. <laughs> it may not actually get returned at all. So that's a, that's a concern you have to think about if that's important. All right, so you can learn more about this stuff here. Started services often, though there's many, many exceptions, including your programming assignment, don't return a result to the activity that started them. Your example is actually a a counterexample because you do return something. You return the, the path name. Um, this, in this particular case, it does perform a single operation. Um, it does return a result. Although I should say that um, it, it, return, it doesn't return the result via on start command. It returns it through another means, which in this case is going to be using the, uh, the messengers we talked about. So this download image and reply retrieves the image and then returns the path name to the image to the client via some other means. The last thing we're going to talk about is how you stop services. So that, of course, is important for the variety of reasons. The main reason why you want to start a, stop a service is either because it's done, and so there's no point in keeping it running, or you want to be a good citizen in the Android ecosystem and not unnecessarily consume resources if there's nothing to do. So if you don't stop a service, it'll just keep running forever, right? Even if the component, usually an activity that launched it, goes away. So if the component the activity is destroyed, the service will still continue to run. So you are responsible for stopping it. There's a couple different ways to do that. One way to do it is to have it shut itself down. So a service can get to a point where it's finished uh, downloading and replying, and so it can say, I want to stop myself. Now, it turns out, which we will talk about this later, there's some very, very subtle logic involved in how you stop services. And this is particularly tricky with concurrent services where there's multiple things running. And I will defer that conversation probably till next Monday, but it's a very important conversation to have. Uh, I think I've hopefully used this metaphor before. It's a good metaphor. Starting up multiple threads, this is one reason, by the way, why the intent service only has one thread in the background doing its bidding because it's easier to keep track of its life cycle. The minute you start having multiple threads, some stuff gets more complicated. And the way to remember this metaphorically is to think about the Sorcerer's Apprentice. Does anybody remember the Sorcerer's Apprentice? Who is the Sorcerer's Apprentice? Mickey Mouse, exactly. This Mickey Mouse is the Sorcerer's Apprentice. So that's a famous movie from the, the great Disney classic work of animation called Fantasia, released in the late 30s or 40s, I think. It was a long time ago, anyway. And uh, Mickey Mouse is basically an, a grad student. You know, let's face it. His advisor is forcing him to do a lot of dirty work. His, his, uh, his advisor basically looks kind of like Dumbledore. And his advisor goes to bed and leaves Mickey in charge of moving this water with, bucket, with a bucket. But Mickey's a smart grad student, so he decides he's going to use automation in order to simplify things. So he starts spawning brooms. Or I guess actually he, take, he has a broom do it once, but then he starts uh, you know, splitting the brooms, and the brooms start to split. So before you know it, he's got like hundreds of brooms doing this water, and he starts to drown, and so on and so forth. 
So the metaphor of sources apprentice that's relevant to threading is it's often easy to start things in motion that are hard to shut down. And threads are like that. It's easy to create threads. Getting threads to shut down correctly and at the right order and the right time is tough. And that's what this funny thing here gets used for. And I'll talk about that later. You can also have other activities shut down a service by telling them to stop. So when stop service is called, whoops, um, that will go ahead and cause the uh, service to, to shut down. That, that was weird. <laughs> Didn't really mean for it to really shut down that far. Um, that was a good example of sh sh shutting down the service externally. So when stop service gets called, this will cause the on destroy method to be called inside the service. So that's an external way of shutting things down. And that's actually what the, um, that's what the wizard does in, in the Sorcerer's Apprentice when he finally wakes up. He comes and uses his magic wand to shut the threads down, uh, shut the brooms down so they stop. Okay, so that's basically the first discussion about starting and stopping services. Let us now move to the next topic. So the previous slides gave you a, a high level boxes and arrows and bubbles and fancy diagram view of how the code works. We're now going to talk about how to implement this stuff using Android. So this will be a little deeper dive where we're going to look at source code instead of just looking at pictures. We'll start with looking at the pictures though. Remember the download activity is the guy that drives this from the GUI point of view. It has a download handler that does its bidding. We'll see it, it has an important role to play. And here's what this looks like. So download activity extends activity as always. It's got a, a bunch of methods in there like uh, you know, on create and so on and on start and on stop and all this good stuff. Uh, the thing we're going to care about here is download image. When you click the download image button on the GUI, this is the button, this is the method that gets called back as a result of that. And what it's going to do is it's going to get the URL entered by the user or a default value if you don't enter anything at all. And then it goes ahead and makes an intent and it uses that intent and it provides a bunch of parameters to it that are used to create the right intent and put the URI in there as a URL, et cetera, et cetera. And then it goes ahead and starts the service. We'll see that one of the parameters passed to make intent is the download handler. And download handler is a handler that knows how to process a response that comes back to the activity from the service that's launched by calling start service. And we'll see that's used for the two-way communication between the client and the, the activity in the service. We'll see that. And you can go back and watch those earlier videos to see how that works. All right, let's take a look at the download service. So the download service basically has a service handler. Most of the work that's interesting gets done in here. We'll see how that works in a second. So download service is a service. Here's that make intent factory method we looked at before. This particular one hard codes things a little bit. As we talked about before, the using a factor method shields the client, the activity from the details of how we make the intent. And we want to do that because that way if we change our mind, we don't have to go change the activity code. We'll just change this one method. So you don't have to worry about the implementation details changing out from underneath you. It makes an intent that's directly associated with the download service class. Of course, we don't have to do it that way. We could have a more general intent like, like you guys are doing in your assignment. So assignment number four reuses a lot of the same intent logic that we use in assignment number three, except we're not starting an activity, we're starting a service. That's the main difference. But it, other things work very similarly. We set the data to be the URI that's passed into the factory method. And then here's the part that's, that's different and cool. So we create a new uh, messenger. If you recall, a messenger is basically a proxy that encapsulates a handler. And we pass in the download handler, which is the thing that comes from the activity. That's what's going to be used as the target of the response from the service back to the activity with the path name that gets downloaded. And that thing gets created and put as an extra into the intent with the name messenger. It's just a string. This is the string name messenger. We could call it anything we want. We just call it messenger. And this then gets passed when we call start service. This intent gets passed over to the service containing the URI so we can know what file to download, and containing a messenger so we know how to get the result back to the client. Win. 
Um, it actually is important because of the way you need to create intents. So we needed to pass that as a parameter to intent. That's why. Or can we pass any context as a parameter? It doesn't seem to affect anything. <laughs> uh, good question. The question is, what is the meaning of context? That is a very deep and profound question, which we're not going to go into in depth right now. But it really has to do with who has visibility on what operations can be performed. That's the view, right? No, that's not the view. That's, it's, the, it's the context. It's not the view. Otherwise, it'd be called view. Um, no, the, the view is, is for something else. The context really says, um, more or less, whose, permission, whose permissions are going to be considered when deciding what operations this particular thing can do. That's the best way to look at it. For, for simple applications like this, it doesn't matter. For more complicated applications, it makes a big difference because it has to do with security uh, and privileges and so on. Security. So here is download service. All right, so that's basically the make intent method. That's the guy that's called by the factory, or called as a factory on the activity. Here's where things get fun, right? So we have a couple of data members. One is called M service looper. It's a looper. We'll talk more about a looper in a little bit. And one's called service handler. This is an Android. Looper is an Androidism. Service handler is something we develop. And you'll notice that both of these things are defined as volatile. What is it? Does anybody remember what it means to be volatile? What does volatile mean? It's, it's a funny name, by the way. I never quite figured out why they use that term volatile. So volatile basically means that reads and writes to these things are atomic. So you can access them in multiple threads. So, and you'll see why this is important. And you can read more about it here if you take a look at this link. The onCreate method, when is this called? It's called when it's first launched, when start service is called the first time. And that goes ahead and creates a thread that runs in the background. And we're going to talk about this. This is very important to understand. This is a very, very important Android idiom with respect to concurrency. But the main thing I want to point out, I want to point out a couple things out at this point. So remember, a service runs in the main thread or the user interface thread even if it's spawned in a separate process. And this is bizarre, right? Go talk to uh, Diane Hackborn. She's the person at Google who did this. By the way, what a great name. That's her name, Diane Hackborn. Like, I was born to hack, you know, literally. So that's kind of like a Dick Tracy villain, you know, or a James Bond villain or something. Um, so that means that if you do long running operations, downloading a file being one of them, downloading an image being one of them, you have to do that in the background thread. So what we do here is we create a new handler thread. And uh, a handler thread is something that, uh, if you go back and watch the Android Looper video, which is available on the uh, YouTube channel, you can learn more about it. I'm not sure whether we'll have a chance to cover this in as much detail as I'd like. If you take CS282, you'll probably get a deeper view of loopers. Um, but basically, a handler thread is an Android class that you can start, and it runs in the background running its own event loop. That's why it's, a lo it's got a looper as part of it. <coughs> and what we do here, which is kind of funky, we, we start up the handler thread. So this is now running in the background. And then we go to the thread, and we say, hey, thread, give me your looper. And then we take that looper. And we go ahead and we pass it to the service handler. And you'll see why that's done that way. The long and the short of it is that by doing this, this crazy thing, the handle message method of the service handler, which is the guy that is going to do all the work, actually gets run in a background thread. That's the, the secret sauce of doing this. And when you look at the Android intent service, you'll see it works the same way. So we create ourselves a handler thread. We start it, so now it's running in the background. We go to that handler thread, and we say, give me your looper. And then we create a new service handler, and we say, you are now associated with this looper. Now, thought question, good quiz question. If we hadn't put service looper here, what thread would the service handler have been associated with? the thread in which it's created, which in this case is the UI thread. Even though this is running in a separate process that doesn't have a user interface, it's still the UI thread from Android's point of view. So if we just said new service handler and hadn't given it a service looper, it would have affinity. It would be connected to the main thread or the UI thread. By giving it the service looper, 
now the handler is associated with the handler thread. The service handler is associated with the handler thread, which means that when messages are given to it, they are processed in that background thread, which is what, exactly what we want to have happen. And if you, um, if you go back and look at the original diagram on the previous slide, it shows the background thread doing this. Yes, sir? Yep, a looper object basically runs a loop. <laughs> um, and in this particular case, it just sits there and it waits for work to show up on its message queue. Its whole life is just sitting there waiting for something to do. And um, if you, if, like I said, if you, if you want to see more about loopers, because I'm not sure we'll have time to cover loopers in the degree to which they should be covered, there's a video on the YouTube channel, my YouTube channel from the POSA 14 MOOC called Android Looper, and it, it explains how it all works. But basically, a looper gives you a bunch of hook methods, and the last thing it does, it gives you a method called loop, and it just sits there and waits for stuff to show up on its message queue. And then it, it, internally, the looper works together with other classes in the so-called handlers, messages, and runnables, or hammer framework, to get the handle message method called back on handlers that are running in the context of that looper. Tristan, do you have a question? That was, that was okay. Good. Yes, exactly. That's exactly right. Other questions? So now, now that we've got all that, that mechanism in place, when on start command is called, remember on start command is called every time you say start service, every time, every time you call start service, on start command is called. The first time you call start service and the service isn't running, on create is called first. So every time this is called, we go ahead and we make something called a download message, and we'll take a look at more what that looks like. And then we Oh, so here's make download message. So make download message makes a message, plops a few things into it, and returns it back here. So we have a message. And then send message is called on the service handler to pass the message from the main thread, or the UI thread of the service, into a queue where it is then handled by the background thread. It'll be handled by the, the handler thread where the handle message method gets called back on the service handler. And we'll see that in a second. So this is basically using that, the hammer framework that we talked about before. And this is saying, you know, hey, if this process is killed, don't bother restarting it. Wait till somebody else wants to download an image, please. Um, here's the service handler class. It is a handler. So that uses the hammer framework. The constructor, as you can see here, basically does a couple things. It takes the looper and it stashes it away. That's the main thing it does. Um, actually, I think I need to edit my slide before I forget. And then the handle message method is what gets called back in the background thread, in the handler thread. And this guy takes the message and calls download image and reply. And you can see the earlier discussion about how the handle message method works. This is just normal hammer framework stuff. And that, of course, will then turn around and reply back to the client. We'll look at that. Yes, sir? Is handle message part of service handler? Or? Good question. So handle message is a method. It's a hook method defined in handler, which is inherited by service handler and overridden by service handler. So it's just a standard. So send message and handle message are handler methods. Send message is just a regular method that passes a message to, a, puts a message on a queue, and then that queue is processed by a thread running the looper for the handler. And that looper thread will ensure that the handle message method gets called back in the right thread context, and that's the thing you override in order to do some work. There's other ways to do it too, but that's a common way to do it. All right, and the last thing we'll talk about here is basically how we stop this stuff. So it'll keep running if you don't shut it down, shut itself down. The tricky part here is you don't want to shut down the processing as long as there's concurrent requests running. Because if you were to shut the service down while there were current requests running, then the, the whole service would disappear and the request would lose their environment because it would, you'd be you know, destroying things halfway through whatever they were doing, or some percentage of the way through what they're doing. So 
An idiom is used in Android to handle this, and this is a little subtle, so I'll describe how it works. If you go and look at the activity manager or the uh, intent service, it does all this stuff for you. Um, but if you don't have that, this is how it works. So basically, this allows you to stop a started service without prematurely terminating its concurrent processing. Does anybody have any questions about what the issue is here? Does anybody, is everybody comfortable with what we're trying to avoid? We're trying to avoid having the metaphorical rug pulled out from underneath threads that are running, thereby making their computations pointless because the rug's been pulled out from underneath them. So we want to make sure that when we stop a service, it doesn't really shut down until everything is done. So I, I guess, uh, let's see, let's, let's find a good metaphor here. So uh, metaphor is you're in a shopping center or you're at the gym, you know, and it's getting close towards closing time. And so they say, you know, um, closing, the gym will be closing in five minutes or whatever. Or the store at Walmart will be closing in five minutes or Target or whatever. And so, you know, please proceed to the cash register or please take a shower and leave by that time. Well, that begs the question, what happens if that time elapses and everybody hasn't left? What do you do? Do you set out with the German shepherds? Do you release poison gas, you know, or do you basically keep the place open until the last person leaves, at which point you shut down? Well, most places do the, the latter because it's good customer service, right? If you kill off your customers, then they don't renew their memberships or whatever. So the, so the point there is you don't want to just pull the rug out from under things. You want them to be able to sh terminate in a coherent way so they finish off what they're doing. So you can read here for more information about this. So let's assume that we have the following scenario. We've got a download service and we've got two calls to start service from within the same activity. And by the way, this would also be the same case if we had two activities. I just want to make it easy. So we have one activity that can have multiple calls to start service. So start service gets called. That'll trigger these intents to get sent over. Either you know, they're going to happen either concurrently if, or in parallel if you've got multi-core machines or one after another if you have one core. The point is that two intents have been sent. Over here in the download service, the second intent, this guy, could actually arrive while the download service is still processing the first intent request. And due to the vagaries of scheduling, it might actually be the case that the second request gets done before the first request. How could that possibly happen? How could it be the case that the thing that shows up later takes longer to, to run than the thing that showed up first? Exactly. So the image could be smaller, or you might be talking to a server that's more heavily loaded in one machine than another, or that network path might be slower because you're going through a satellite link versus a, a LAN. You know, who knows, right? There could be different reasons why things would take longer amounts of time to run. So just because something starts later doesn't necessarily mean it, it's going to finish later. Things can finish earlier. So what will happen, of course, is the, the message will come in. And we don't want the download service, this, this whole thing over here, to shut itself down when it's done processing the first request or it'll terminate the second request prematurely, which would be a bad thing. So here's what we do instead. So every request that comes into the system is given its start ID, which is a monotonically increasing number that is incremented every time a new request comes in. So every time on start command gets called, its start ID is incremented by one. Right? So what happens here, and, and the system internally keeps track of the biggest start ID, so it knows how many requests have come in. So we had, if you go back and look at the slides a few slides earlier, we'd actually taken the start ID and we'd stuck it inside the message as arg1, which sounds like something a, a pirate might say, you know, arg1. So in this particular case, download image and reply gets called. And when we're done, we call stop self and we pass in this message. So we're going to pass this message uh, parameter in, and this is the start ID. And the way that Android works is it only stops the service when the start ID matches the last start request. So only when it's the last request that's being shut down do we really shut down. If it's one that's from before that, we don't shut down because we know that there's still other requests that are pending. And therefore, we want to wait until those are finished before we shut the whole thing down.
is it individually tracking each ID? It's got a counter that it, in, it increments internally. And so it, when you call stop self, it checks to say, it says, is this number less than the, the start ID that's the last one? And if so, ignore, starts, ignore the stop. Otherwise, stop it. When it, it actually does, in fact, stop, it then goes ahead and calls quit. And that shuts the looper down. And then that causes that thread to exit. And then the whole thing can shut down gracefully. OK, so that's more soup to nuts about this stuff. And the cool part about all this, of course, is that um, as you're doing assignment number four, you should be taking a look at this stuff. And you will see tidbits of things to learn. All right, this is the third and final part of this particular discussion. Um, this part is actually one of the most important parts because it shows how to use the messenger to actually do the work to get the results back. So it, we're going to give a slightly different view of this thing. Um, as, you, as, we, as we discussed a week and a half ago, messengers are a means for communicating messages back from one component to another in Android, typically from a service back to an activity. We're going to talk about using messengers to send messages from started services back to activities. All right, so again, remember uh, what we talked about before. We've got activity in a service. We have different perspectives. We, uh, whoops, if you look at those slides, that's just showing where this, you can get this stuff from. All right. So here's how this works. So the download activity does a couple of things. It creates a download handler and a messenger that's going to be used to encapsulate the handler. So here is the reply handler. And here's the messenger that is associated or encapsulated with that handler. And then it goes ahead and creates an intent. And it's going to pass the messenger as an extra to the intent. That's the code we looked at before. When we call start service, that intent gets sent over to the server. The service runs. And various things happen. So that's what we're going to talk about. So here's what happens on the service side. The intent cr crosses a process boundary from activity process to service process. And the service then, as you saw, creates a handler, creates a service handler, a handler thread, queues up the intent in the, the queue that's managed by the handler thread. And then the handler thread is used to dispatch the intent, retrieve the, uh, the image, download it, store it in a file and then return the path name back to the sender. So it does a return to sender. Why is there a picture of Elvis here? And what was the song? There you go. Very good. I was at a, I was at a conference a week ago during spring break. And there was a, a psychologist that was talking about how to make effective slides. And he, he, he said, use no extraneous images other than the ones needed to convey the point. And I thought, boy, that's boring, right? So I like to have Elvis in my slides, way cooler than boring slides. The, the best part was he, he talked at length about the importance of all these psychological principles for structuring the way you give presentations. And his entire talk was in um, a serif font. And I don't know if you know anything about fonts, but serif fonts have you know, their little squirrels and, and fanciness. And they're very hard to read at a distance. I mean, they look nice if you're J.R.R. Tolkien, right? And you're reading a wonderfully illuminated book, you know, handwritten. Uh, but if you're standing 50 feet back in an auditorium, it's hard to see. And, and it was very hard to read his slides. So I was kind of laughing if, did he really have the credibility to tell us? Was he eating his own dog food was the question I asked myself. And the answer is no. So it turns out that there are uh, a bunch of patterns and idioms that are used here. And uh, the key idioms are the command processor pattern and the concurrent service stopping idiom, which we just talked about. And uh, so I'm going to kind of show you how all these different things work. So basically, let's see, this is just sort of the same view, just showing what's going on there. It turns out that the way of doing these things, the, these steps, are so canonical that Android provides an intense service that's used to automate all this stuff. And we'll talk about this later. So uh, that'll be the thing we'll talk about when we come back next Monday. Basically allows you to take asynchronous commands represented as intents and have them run in a background thread. So all the stuff we talked about before in the last set of slides 
is baked into the intent service framework and it applies the command processor pattern. Oh, the, the, the concurrent service stopping idiom. And, and the, and what was the, other one? the command processor so pattern. Those are, both, those, are the things, those are both baked into the intent service? Yes, okay. yes. Well, actually, the command processor pattern is, baked in, is definitely baked into the intent service, um, as is the concurrent service stopping idiom or pattern, okay. the, um, which is very specific to Android. That's why it's an idiom, not a pattern. But the implementation we're looking at here also implements both those things as well. It's just that the intent service bakes it into the framework so you don't have to know about how it works. You can just program by filling in the blanks, whereas this implementation requires ever so much more understanding. So let's go ahead and take a look at how this works. So here's the download activity just to refresh your memory. And it's got a download handler in it, which is created with this, uh, with this thing. And so when download image gets called, it's going to pass the download handler here. And then in the download service, as we saw before, that, that guy is going to go ahead and put this into the intent so it gets on the service side. This is just kind of a recap of what we talked about before. So let's take a look at how this works under the hood. When the request comes in, this is the download image and reply method. We'd only briefly talked about this before. And what it's going to do is it's going to take the intent and it's going to call the download image method, which actually retrieves the image. And, and you guys have seen that code from your previous implementation, so I won't go through that in detail. It then goes ahead and extracts the messenger out of the intent, which was stored there with that factory method we just looked at. And then it calls a helper method called send path, which takes the path name that came back when we downloaded the image and the messenger. And send path makes a reply message, which we'll look at in a second. And then it's going to send that message back to the activity via the send method on the messenger that we extracted out of the intent, if that all makes sense. Here's make reply method. It's a factory method that makes the message that we're going to return. It says whether the thing succeeded or failed or not. And then there's all this funky code, which is basically used to create something called a bundle. And a bundle is a piece of code that can tra traverse across process address spaces which is what we need to be able to do here because the service is running in a different address space than the activity is. So it makes a bundle, sticks the various things back in the bundle, and passes that back as a return value. That gets sent back via the messenger to the activity. And then that thing, if we take a quick look at that, that then comes back via the handle message method on the download handler. So the messengers are being used as proxies to connect together the, the handlers that are running in different address spaces. That's, that's the power of the messenger. And then we go ahead, that, this is running in the user interface thread. We then go ahead and extract out the path name from this thing using a helper method that's defined in the download service. And then depending on what happens, of course, we go ahead and uh, here's get path name. So it just basically goes here, extracts out the path name from the data where it was stored in the make reply message method we saw before. So it gets the path name back if it found one. Uh, and then it takes the path name, and if it failed, if it didn't, have, if it didn't download an image, it's because it went wrong. So it shows a dialog that says, hey, I didn't download anything. If it succeeds, it calls this method, which takes the file, turns it into an image, and then displays it. Notice that this way of doing things never causes the download activity to block in the user interface thread for any extended period of time. Because anything that would block is pushed off to the service, and in the service things are running concurrently, and the download activity is doing whatever it's doing, but it's not blocking until the path name comes back, in which case the Android activity and in, uh, intense framework basically gets the method called back, the, the handle message method called back on the download handler. Yes, sir? That's the service side. Okay. The client side, now, so that's, that's the service side, the activity side, the client side. When this code got called back here, let's go back just a couple seconds as we wrap this up. When send gets, now we're in the service, right? So when send gets called on the messenger, that's in the service process, that ends up causing the handle message method in the download handler on the client 
activity to get called back. And then that guy goes ahead and, and displays the image. But it was never blocked. It just gets a call back when the results are done. And then it goes ahead and displays the results. So as it says here, it's never blocked synchronously.